Caribbean Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. Haiti's president resolute he will not step down as violent protests continue and travel advisories are issued. Our top story in Caribbean Newsline for Friday, February 15th. From the CMC News Center in Bridgetown, I'm Don Paris. Good evening. Haitians on Friday vow to keep protesting until President Juvenal Moïse resigns, although he has announced that his government will be implementing economic measures aimed at quelling more than a week of violent demonstrations across the country. Moïse is insisting he will not give in to the opposition demands for his resignation, and he has promised citizens he has no intention of putting the country in the hands of armed gangs and drug traffickers. In an address to the nation on Thursday night, Moïse acknowledged that the ongoing political crisis is very serious. He said he has heard the voice of the people and knows the problems that torment citizens and has therefore asked the Prime Minister to share details of new economic measures and implement them without delay. His announcement came amid continued protests about skyrocketing inflation and the government's failure to prosecute corruption related to the petro Carib agreement under which Haiti got oil from Venezuela at subsidized prices. At least seven people have been killed in the protests so far and several others injured in clashes with police. Moise said that while people have a right to demonstrate, it's unacceptable for people in positions to protest alongside armed gang leaders who are wanted by the authorities. He said he's open to having dialogue with the opposition to find a solution to the crisis. However, the opposition is not interested in any talks with the president. Meantime, the Canadian and U.S. governments are urging their citizens not to travel to Haiti due to the civil unrest. Canada's embassy in Haiti also closed on Wednesday, and the U.S. State Department is pulling all non-emergency personnel and their family members from the country. The St. Kitts Nevis government has warned of tougher measures to deal with crime as the Twin Island Federation recorded six murders in one week. The Dr. Timothy Harris administration warned that nothing is off the table as it announced new initiatives to deal with the unprecedented spate of violent crime. A government statement confirmed that Cabinet met on Thursday with high-level representatives of the key agencies responsible for national security and border safety to discuss the situation. It said the government is committed to adding more teeth to existing anti-gang anti legislation in quick time with the aim of effectively discouraging gang membership and deterring and punishing crime and the security forces had been mandated to apply maximum pressure on known criminal elements. It's anticipated that might cause some inconvenience to the general public, and the cabinet has therefore apologized for that in advance. A new plot by two incarcerated gang leaders and one of their associates to assassinate Trinidad and Tobago's police commissioner, Gary Griffith, has been uncovered. Guardian Media is reporting that intelligence sources say the contract to kill was connected to last week Wednesday's human trafficking bust in which 18 Spanish-speaking girls were rescued. The report of the latest contract to kill plot comes almost three months after a special branch report in November last year, which The Guardian reported on earlier this month, that gangs were planning to take out Griffith. And the top cop has confirmed he knows about the latest plan. We get more from CNC3's Mark Wissant on the contents of the report about the plot. Intelligence sources who spoke to Guardian Media on the condition of strict anonymity confirmed that the report was forwarded to Commissioner Griffith for his perusal the same day it was prepared. Guardian Media spoke to Griffith about the report we obtained from intelligence sources. I am fully aware that there has been yet another plan for an assassination attempt on me, and I, I expect this will continue. Uh, the more I decide to peg back criminal elements, the more they will be frustrated, 
as I stated before, this is a multi-billion dollar industry and there are many toes I'm stepping on. The toes may vary from persons who may be wearing their pants one, one foot off um, from their waistline to those um, wear with a Hugo Boss suit. It is irrelevant to me. I will do what is required. I have my job to do. They have theirs. If they feel that theirs is to try to take me out, it is totally irrelevant for me. They could try. It will be an effort and futility. The two-page report was dated Friday, January 8th, 2019, but the 8th fell on a Tuesday in January. However, sources familiar with the contents of the document told Guardian Media that was a typographical error, and it was, in fact, Friday, February 8th. This report came almost three months after a special branch report in November last year that Guardian Media reported exclusively, which revealed that the Muslim and Rasta city gangs were planning to wipe out Commissioner Griffith. The report under the heading information indicated, R has taken a job to assassinate the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service Commissioner from unknown persons. R is communicating with N from Marabella, who is presently remanded at the maximum security prison. N, through his associate J, also of Marabella, has recruited the shooters for this assassination from Lavantil. J has a sister who lives in Lavantil who is set to falsify deeds and birth certificates for the purpose of bailing detained persons. N is using cellular number 35 dot 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 to communicate from within prison. The report further lists comments associated with the individuals who are involved in this plot to kill Commissioner Griffith. It said, N was the leader of a criminal gang located in Marabella prior to his incarceration for murder. J was a rival to N for control of Marabella, but N prevailed. Both men mended their relationship in 2018 through mutual association with A, a.k.a. S. The report continued, J is believed to reside in East Port of Spain, frequently travel overseas with falsified documents. He is also in a romantic relationship with J, a former councillor, name of corporation called. The SORT team made five security suggestions on how to deal with this plot to quickly and effectively bring the perpetrators to justice. Those suggestions Guardian Media felt needed to be kept confidential. In Jamaica, the man described as a person of interest in the murder of opposition MP Dr. Lynnville Bloomfield has been released from police custody. He was picked up on Wednesday and held overnight by investigators who took statements from him, but he was then released on Thursday. According to local reports, lawmen discovered the man had been communicating via cell phone with the late Portland East MP. He had made several demands of Dr. Bloomfield, including money, a car, and a cell phone. The late MP was found at his East Portland home with multiple stab wounds on the night of February 2nd. Two knives and a bloodied vest recovered at the house have been sent to a forensic lab for testing. Guyana's president meets with his ministers, but government insists it was no cabinet meeting. Stay with us. War with germs. The Oxitec antimicrobial glove is wasting no time, folks. Quite right, Tammy. I see no way for the germs duo to come back from this. Oh, what a slam. What a slam. Oxitec is the winner in less than a minute. WWG champion of the world. Find our champion at www.psci.biz or give us a call at 417-0777 has always been education and I have come to love wines and spirits having spent over 12 years in it um, as I say to persons all the time working in wines and spirits you work morning and evening it's a 24 hour job and so my 12 years is 24 um, and so having also traveled all over the world and seen how bartenders and mixologists are revered they are respected I said you know what we can do it here in Jamaica as well Welcome back. Guyana's President David Granger on Friday met with members of his cabinet in what has been referred to as a plenary session. 
The usual cabinet meeting was replaced by this plenary as the government sought not to contravene a high court ruling that the motion of no confidence passed by the National Assembly last month had effectively led to the downfall of the coalition government. Minister of State Joseph Harmon described the meeting as an extended cabinet held under the chairmanship of the president with all government ministers present. We get more in this Newsroom Guyana report. Minister of State Joseph Harmon usually briefs the media after cabinet meetings. On Friday, he held a briefing, but not one of cabinet, he said, but one of a plenary of ministers. Cabinet meetings have not been held, Harmon stated, since the Chief Justice declared that the cabinet was immediately disbanded on the night of December 21st. But what is this plenary of ministers that has been meeting in place of the cabinet? So the plenaries are, as I said, an extended cabinet with all of the ministers included. Now it is noted that in fact um, there is a, a judgment of the court that was made with respect to the cabinet and that judgment is appealed but we have not a stay of the judgment as yet and therefore we have not held cabinet meetings as such. Cabinet plenaries however are, are chaired by the president and include all of the ministers and therefore has all of the powers that a cabinet um, ministerial plenaries that, that a cabinet can have. Though Harmon declared the plenary of ministers is not the cabinet, but it has all the powers of a cabinet, he could not state a specific law which provides for this meeting of the ministers. The appointment of a minister sitting as a minister appointed in a meeting with the president has the full authority of the government to perform its functions. That's what I'm trying to get, sir. What yeah. authority are you citing? Wh which part of the law or the Constitution provides for this? The, the provision under government, the Constitution, provision under the President. The meeting of the plenary of ministers has given the go-ahead for the award of several multi-million dollar contracts, but Harmon denied that this was so, insisting that the plenary was being informed that the contracts were awarded and making a note that this was done. The contracts are determined by the National Procurement and Tender Board Administration. They are usually sent for a noting, that is to say, for the recognition that these contracts have been finalized and have been issued. So there is no question of an objection or approval where those are concerned. It's just a noting, and that has always been the position with respect to that. Though Harmon said the government was adhering to the ruling of the Chief Justice by not having the cabinet meet, the president has not moved to name a date for elections. The December 21st no-confidence motion provides for elections in 90 days, and the High Court has confirmed that the motion was valid. Well, it's all about soca, reggae and jazz in this week's Newsline Entertainment. Preparations are underway for Barbados' Reggae Festival and organizers of Tobago Jazz Festival say competing events in April will not affect this year's show. 16 artists will do battle in the International Soca Monarch Competition on March 1st in Trinidad. Eight performers each were chosen last weekend to compete in the Groovy International Soca Monarch and the Power International Soca Monarch. One of the most popular tunes, Run With It, by Grenadian Mr. Killer, prompted a warning from the police after people began picking up other people's belongings when the song is being played and, you guessed it, running with it. Preparations are well underway for this year's Reggae Festival in Barbados. Organizers anticipate a huge turnout for this year's festival because of the main attraction, Bujabantan, on April 27. Promoter Al Jilks of FAS Promotions says the popular Reggae on the Hill will not be staged this year to accommodate Buju's Long Walk to Freedom concert. This year we've had to forego Reggae on the Hill in order to accommodate Buju because staging two events of that magnitude back to back was virtually impossible for us in terms of manpower, in terms of infrastructure setup, in terms of um, air transportation from all, of, all, the other, all the places that these people will be coming from and all the other um, uh, elements which go into making a show of this nature of or, or, or an event of this nature possible. 
And the weekend of April 27 will also see the staging of the Tobago Jazz Festival. Chairman of the Tobago Festival's Commission, George Leacock, says they will also have to compete with the Jamaica Carnival, but he's confident that their strong marketing campaign will reap benefits for Tobago Jazz. That the festival in 2019 clashes with the Jamaica Carnival. And if the Tobago House of Assembly had not taken, shall I say, wise again decision to stay on the playing field in 2018, I have no idea where we would have been coming from today to try to start an event with a reputation that was not the reputation we liked and to at the same time compete with the Jamaica Carnival. Because we were able to go so far in correcting the perception of the festival in 2018, we can step out boldly in 2019 knowing that we are in a position to attract our share of visitors. Mary Claire Williams, Newsline Entertainment. Ahead in Newsline Sport, Cricket West Indies supports the ICC's Get Tough policy on player abuse. We'll be right back with the details after the break. Continue with sports now. In the wake of a four-match ODI ban dished out to Indies fast bowler Shannon Gabriel, Cricket West Indies CWI says it's in firm agreement with the International Cricket Council's Get Tough policy on player abuse. Gabriel was slapped with the punishment by Cricket's world governing body for comments he made to Captain of England Joe Root on the third day of the final test in St. Lucia. In an article in the Trinidad and Tobago Newsday newspaper, CWI's chief executive, Johnny Graves, said, quote, The ICC has put in place a zero tolerance on any abuse on the field by players, and we are fully supportive of that. I think in terms of the way the series has been played, it's been played in great spirits by two teams that have gone hard at each other over three tests. It is disappointing we are talking about one isolated incident, which I hope does not tarnish what has otherwise been a fantastic series in terms of the quality of the cricket and also the manner and spirit in which both sides have played." End quote. The regional cricket boss believes Gabriel will learn from this, but said it was disappointing he has to learn the hard way. Gabriel was not named in the Windy squad for the first two one dares against England in Barbados, but was expected to feature later in the five-match series. 
Former Bermuda all-rounder Herbie Bascom has been named as the island's new national cricket coach. The 54-year-old has agreed to an initial one-year contract starting the part-time post on March 1st. Bascom replaces another former Bermuda team player, Clay Smith, who withdrew his services last October after his three-year contract expired. Bermuda cricket has been in the doldrums internationally since Trinidadian Gus Logie, who had Bascom as his assistant, led the island to the 2007 World Cup in the Caribbean. It hit a new low last year when the country was relegated to the ICC's World Cricket League Division 5 after finishing bottom of a Division 4 tournament in Malaysia. Bascom's initial task is to prepare the Bermuda squad for the ICC Americas Region T20 World Cup qualifying tournament, which Bermuda will host from August 15th to 25th. The Caribbean Premier League CPL will be looking to expand to a new territory in the region. The top brass of the CPL recently paid a visit to the Cayman Islands with the hope of tapping into the U.S. market. Cayman 27's Jordan Armenese has that story. We wanted to come have a look at what's on offer here, both from a playing and a facilities perspective, and maybe with the opportunity to play some games there. Caribbean Premier League Chief Operating Officer Pete Russell is hoping to bring the region's top pro cricket league to Cayman. But are the right facilities in place? Russell says West Bay's Jimmy Powell Oval is about halfway there. There's a lot of space in and around the, the, the ground. The ground is the right dimension. Yes, there's a bit of a, agronomy work that's needed, but nothing that won't, uh, won't trouble us. But this isn't just passing interest, rather a three-game deal with the possibility of Cayman getting a CPL team, the first professional sports franchise for the country. We could be flexible, but I think that would be the minimum that we'd look at is three. Um, and, you know, there's, there's uh, opportunities going forward. I mean, we, we don't want to just look at this as a one, two-year uh, opportunity, but maybe host the team here at some point because it's perfectly placed in terms of the U.S., and then getting down to the Caribbean. And after six seasons of play, Russell says the league has helped put smaller nations on the map. We've got St. Kitts who have their team, and if you look at what it's done for them, you know, they're better known now for having a cricket team in CPL than, than probably anything else. So uh, the impact I think it can have is, is tremendous. But why came in and why now? Russell says it's a perfect fit. This is far more progressive than pretty much anywhere we play. So you've got the hotels, you've got the infrastructure, the people. Um, so actually, the onus would be on us to make sure we put on a good event, which uh, we know we do. But could the CPL's interest in Cayman be related to the potential sale and movement of the powerhouse Jamaica Talawas? Russell says that's not the case. The government haven't necessarily been as supportive as they might in Jamaica, so... Yeah, the owner quite rightly is looking at his options. It's like any other franchise team. You look at it with U.S. Uh, sports teams all the time, they move. So he's looking at it. Uh, he might move, he might not. But um, you know, Jamaica is an important venue for CPL, as I'm sure you're aware. Whatever happens, Russell says the discussions are in the infancy stage. But if the two sides do move forward, he's making his case for a long-term partnership. Tourism is all about creating a, an opportunity, a product that has lasting benefits over time. So, you know, what we're not about is just flying in, you know, doing something for four or five days and flying out because that has, a, in my view, minimal uh, long-term impact. A child care and protection agency in Jamaica is raising red flags about the high number of unreported cases of young athletes who may have been sexually abused by their coaches. TVJ's Karen Madden reports. It's been the dirty little secret that has been dogging sports for a long time. Coaches accused of various forms of sexual abuse against those they are sworn to protect. Sissoka and the OCA say, in addition to sexual abuse, coaches have also been accused of physical abuse and neglect. Children's advocate Diane Gordon Harrison says in 2018 alone, her office received 11 reports of abuse by coaches against children, six of them sexual. But she says she's concerned that more perpetrators are being shielded by a veil of silence. And what I want to assure persons is that due process will always flow. But what needs to be done is that we need to get to the stage whereby 
not because it's somebody who is in authority versus somebody who has little power most times, which is a student athlete, we should do nothing about it or defer to the experience of the coach who is an issue so that it becomes a matter that's swept under the carpet. And she says even when reports are made, cooperation is oftentimes low. Let's be real, especially where persons are of the view that there is a power dynamic and their chances could be thwarted or they could be the ones that are vilified because they have stepped forward, persons may be reluctant. And Gordon Harrison, who addressed the issue at a recent Jamaica Olympic Association seminar, says reports have already reached her desk since the start of the year, in addition to the six from last year. When we spoke about sexual nature, we're talking about um, unwanted touches, um, kissing, uh, hugging, uh, making very suggestive remarks in relation to the child, and also inviting children to perform certain acts on, on coaches. But Sisoka says the agency receives a fewer reports than the OCA due to various factors. This disparity could mean that maybe some of those matters were not reported to us, or it could be that some of them were reported to us, or all of them were reported to us, but we did not. It was not possible for us to establish an offence. And that's the sport. We'll be right back. Caribbean Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. War with germs. The Oxitec antimicrobial glove is wasting no time, folks. Quite right, Tammy. I see no way for the germs duel to come back from this. Oh, what a slam. What a slam. Oxitec is the winner in less than a minute. WWG champion of the world. Find our champion at www.psci.biz or give us a call at 417-0777. Don't jump up to this non-stop turn and twist. What up, it's your boy French Montana. It's me, Smokey Robinson. It's your boy David Doe. Hi, I'm LMA. This is Mucha Banton, and I'll be performing live with the Shiloh Band in St. Kitts Music Festival. Don't miss the 23rd annual St. Kitts Music Festival, June 26th to June 30th, 2019. Featuring Mucha Banton, Smokey Robinson, Popcorn, and LMA. Also, Davido, French Montana, Fimba, Edwin Yearwood, and Crossfire. Coco Teak, Skinny Fabulous, Shal Marshall, Charlie Black, Farmer Nappy, Nadia Batson, Infamous, New Vibes Band, and many, many more. It will be epic. It will be mind-blowing. It will be jaw-dropping. It will be awesome. The Think It's Music Festival, an experience like no other. For more information and to buy tickets, log on to www.thinkitsmusicfestival.com. Again, the major developments of this day, Haiti's President Juvenile Moise resolute he will not step down as violent protests continue and the U.S. and Can Canadian governments advise citizens not to travel to the CARICOM nation. And in sport, in the wake of a four-match ODI ban dished out to Wendy's fast bowler Shannon Gabriel, Cricket West Indies says it's in agreement 
with the ICC's Get Tough policy on player abuse. That's Caribbean Newsline for news and sport around the clock. Subscribe to CanaNews.com. For more of our programming, log on to Caribbean. The statistics are by no means flattering. They will shock you into silence. As recent figures revealed by the Help and Shelter Crisis Service in Guyana show an increasingly large number of women seeking help at that center from domestic violence, many of them in desperate need of psychiatric attention. This is not a Guyana problem as women around the world remain vulnerable to the terror and debilitating effects of domestic abuse by their male partners. What are the implications of this?